I'm really glad that Larry was talking about um, the idea that we can't make this stuff up because that's exactly how I feel about what I have to share with you tonight. So, it's early April. I've just woken up and I'm doing one of those like laying in bed, checking Facebook, trying to figure out how long I can lay here before I really have to get up and get ready to go to class. Um, 2014. And I get up finally, take a shower. It's going to be like a really hot day in April. So I go downstairs, put on shorts and a tank top, and I go back into my bedroom to dry my hair. And I do one of these like <laughs> drying upside down, you know, drying the sides. And then I raise my arms above my head to dry the back of my hair, and my eyes sort of drift to my reflection in the mirror, and I notice bruises, dark red and purple marks scattered along the undersides of my arms and my neck and my chest. And immediately, I panic. I start quickly running through all of the places I'm going to be that day, everyone I'm going to see, who's going to notice, who's going to ask questions. It's going to be way too hot for me to put on a sweater or a jacket or a scarf. And I don't wear makeup on my face, and so I start digging through drawers to find something that I can use. And I come upon this almost empty bottle of concealer that my grandmother bought me in the sixth grade. And I start squeezing out the little drops that are left and sort of gently applying it to my sensitive skin until anyone who might take a second glance would simply think that they had seen a shadow. And then I went about the rest of my day. And I tell you about that otherwise normal morning because it was the first time that I had a real glimmer of recognition that maybe, just maybe, something was very, very wrong. It would be over a month from that day before I broke up with the man who gave me those bruises. It would be four months before I stopped talking to him altogether. And it would be six months before I began to recognize the extent of the abuse that I had suffered during the course of our relationship. In the nine months that we were together, I was bitten, shoved, kicked, tripped, trapped, lied to, yelled at, manipulated, coerced, raped, and isolated. Those on the outside of our relationship who were close to me could tell that something was wrong and they spoke up. But so deep were the layers of deception that I couldn't hear their words and they couldn't see what was really going on behind closed doors. So it wasn't until I had cut off contact with him completely that I began to experience flashbacks and realize exactly what had happened to me. It's been less than two years since I stopped talking to him, and it's been about a year and a half of really intense processing and healing, and I'm very fortunate to have a wonderful support system and lots of resources at my beck and call. Um, and one of the ways that I have found is a very healthy coping me mechanism is laughter. So, although this may seem like somewhat of a depressing story, I would like to also make you laugh a little bit. So, what I have to tell you is that um, most of my good friends and I refer to this gentleman as Voldemort. Um, <laughs> I love Harry Potter, and it's just way easier than saying his real name. And so we call him Voldemort, and it's also really fun when I've had like a super terrible day, or like the smell of someone behind me in Chipotle triggers a memory. I like raise my fingers up in the air, and I'm like, F you, Voldemort! And there's like some like deep satisfaction in my gut that comes from saying screw you to the Dark Lord and knowing that I have actually escaped his powerful grasp. <laughs> and I find that there is a lot of healing in humor. So this last fall, um, as Chris mentioned, I'm a teacher, and so I was getting ready to go into my practicum experience um, at a high school here in Lincoln. And I was kind of nervous because I was experiencing a lot of symptoms still from post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I went to my therapist and I said, dude, we got to do something about this. Like, I cannot be a crazy person while I'm in the classroom. And I told her, you know, I had tried medication, but I didn't want to deal with the side effects. So she told me about this therapy called EMDR. And for some of you may have heard of it, but it's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. And for all of you in this room that just forgot all those words and the order that they go in, you can refer to it, as my friends and I do, as the blinking thing. <laughs> so um, essentially, from my elementary understanding of the way the blinking thing works, is that our brains download memories during REM sleep, so rapid eye movement. And so the idea is we can take memories that have been processed as traumatic and sort of reprocess them to make them less traumatic and more controllable. 
at the same time, that often helps resurface memories that may have been repressed so that you can deal with it. Essentially, what this meant was that I was going to willingly go into a room with a near stranger and re-experience and recount all of the most traumatic moments of my life. <laughs> I thought that sounded like the definition of insanity, and I was trying really hard to not be a crazy person. But I didn't really have any other options that I thought were feasible, and so I went. And I have a therapist who I love, and this was a different therapist, and so it took some getting used to, and I, I go in, and I sit on her couch for the first time, and you know, the room is kind of dim, and it's quiet, and she speaks in this very calming, soothing voice, and she says, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put this tray on your lap, and it has a board on it, and I'm gonna tell you to think about something. And then I'm gonna turn the light on, and you're gonna watch it move back and forth with your eyes, and then when it stops, you're going to tell me what you noticed. And I was like, okay, I'm paying you $150 for this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so she puts the tray on my lap, right? And it looks like um, a scoreboard that you use for, like, basketball or something, but a lot smaller, like, wooden frame. It's got some lights on it. And she puts it on my lap, and she sits down, and she says, okay, I want you to think I'm unsafe, I'm trapped, and I don't have any choices. I was like, what the hell, lady? I just spent the last year telling myself that I am safe, I'm not trapped, and I do have choices, because otherwise I wind up laying fetal in my bed all day long. But I didn't say any of that because, again, I was paying her $150 to be there. So <laughs> she puts this tray on my lap, and I start trying to think about these things, but all I can think about is the fact that I'm sitting on this lady's couch watching a light move back and forth on a board. Um, and so she does it like four times. And y'all, like, watch me right now. Like, like, I look like a crazy person. If you do it, you'll feel like a crazy person. But I did it, and all I could think about was that the stupid light was moving. And so the fifth time rolls around, and when she, right before she turns off the light, I suddenly remember that while I was dating this guy, I was in a fiction writing class. And I almost didn't even tell her that I remembered this because I thought that we were supposed to be processing these really hard, awful memories, and I didn't think it seemed relevant. But it was the only thing that had come to my mind. And so I told her, hey, I just remembered I was in this fiction class, and I think I wrote some stuff, but I don't remember what it was, and I, maybe it's important. And she asked me if I had access to those files, and I said, yeah. And she said, go home and read them. So I went home. And I made myself a grilled cheese sandwich, and I sat down at my kitchen table on my computer, found the folder that said Intro to Fiction Writing, and I came across a document that was written in March of 2014, so one month before the incident I was telling you about earlier. And I open it up and start reading. And it's a short story, page and a half long, and it's written from the perspective of a teenage girl who's in a relationship with an older guy who's a fugitive. And her parents are completely against the relationship, and so she has to sneak him into her room at night, and she lies to them about the relationship. And she doesn't call him this in the story, but he's, it's very clear that he is needy. He needs her to comfort him. He needs her to help him fall asleep. So in the story, they have sex, and then she falls asleep, and then she wakes up to him having sex with her, which I would define as rape. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table reading this story, and I've completely forgotten about my lunch, and my heart starts pounding, and it feels like it's going to jump out of my chest, and I'm hyperventilating, you know, just gasping for breath, to the point where my vision is starting to go black because I don't have enough oxygen going to my brain. And so I sort of like crumble onto the living room floor, and I'm sobbing so loudly that our poor little dog like goes running away because I'm making so much noise. And the emotions were so intense that I literally resorted to infantile responses and was banging my fists and feet against the floor. You can laugh at stuff. <laughs> I like to laugh about this. Um, and finally, I like calmed myself down enough to call my friend Renee, and I said, Renee, I'm freaking out. She to calm me down, help me learn how to breathe, and we sort of processed why I was freaking out so much about this short story. And what scared me so much was not only that I didn't remember writing this clearly vivid description of what was happening in my life, but that the narrator in the story had these horrific things happening to her and she did not know that they were bad. And that was exactly what had happened to me. And there was this sort of preserved piece of how my brain was working at that point in time. 
And it both frightened me, but also comforted me because I've had a really hard time recalling all of the things that happened and gaining control over my memories in that area. And so it's simultaneously super weird and super awesome that I have this piece of who I was at a time that I can now barely remember. So uh, for those of you who are curious, I did keep going to the blinking thing. <laughs> um, I went every Thursday for um, several months and inevitably, every week, somebody would be like, hey, how's your day? And I would have to fight the urge to be like, well, I just sat through and processed all of the most dramatic moments of my life. How's your day? Um, but I was really glad for the opportunity to try that and to try something that was hopefully going to work. And it didn't heal me, but it did help me remember a lot of things that I couldn't previously remember. And it's also helped me to gain a lot more control over things um, like memories or when I experience flashbacks and to understand when they're coming and how to deal with them. And so I feel like a really crappy storyteller because I'm telling you a story that doesn't actually have an ending because I'm smack dab in the middle of it. <laughs> but here's what I do know. The biggest issue for me right now is I feel like I have these two separate parts of myself. On the one hand, I'm a fairly successful, I've been told I'm a talented teacher. I have a lot of really wonderful, awesome people in my life, family and friends who are supportive and encouraging and push me through the pain onto joy. But I also have this part of my life that feels like a complete mess. It feels like it's out of control, I don't understand it, and sometimes I really don't want to accept that it's part of my story. And I would imagine that most of us here in this room have some part of our stories that we hate, that we don't want to talk about, that we wish was not part of who we are. And it doesn't matter where you are on your journey with that. I go through the different stages of grief on a daily basis. Sometimes I just live in denial because it's a lot easier. But what I have learned is that even when everything seems terrible, I can look at myself in the mirror and say, this is not forever. And I can be grateful for one thing, that this is my story, all of the parts of it, and that means that I get to write the ending. Thank you.